This lesson provides a very general overview of the IELTS exam. So let's start from the very beginning. What is the IELTS? Well, as I'm sure you know, the IELTS is a test of English language proficiency. The whole point is usually to measure English language ability and then report scores to colleges and universities or employers or sometimes uh, for immigration purposes. IELTS stands for International English Language Testing System. It is one of the most widely used English language exams around the world. There are two main forms of the IELTS. The first is the academic IELTS, and that version, as you can guess, is used ma mainly by colleges and universities for admissions decisions. Then there's the general training IELTS, and that one is more often used by employers or for immigration purposes and some other uses as well. In our lessons, we will cover the, the differences between these two exams so you can focus your studies. At this point, if you don't know already, you should definitely find out which version of the exam you will be required to take because they are different exams. Okay, who makes the IELTS? The IELTS is a joint partnership among the British Council, IDP Education, which is based in Australia, and Cambridge English Language Assessment. The creators of this exam have intentionally made an internationally focused exam. So, for example, you can expect to hear a wide variety of accents on the listening section of the exam. You may hear Canadian accent, you may hear someone from New Zealand or Australia or the, U, uh, the UK. Many different accents and many different forms of native English are represented on this exam. Some of the general features of this test. So the full IELTS takes 2 hours and 45 minutes to complete. And that's true for the general training and the academic IELTS. But the exam is divided into two major sections. So you have the paper exam, and on the paper exam you will take the listening, reading, and writing sections, okay? And that will all occur in one session with no breaks. All right, so that, uh, the paper exam is separate from the speaking exam, which you schedule separately at a different time. Now you can take the speaking exam on the same day as the paper exam, but you can also take it one week before or one week after your paper exam. The speaking exam is an in-person interview that lasts about 11 to 15 minutes, so it is a much shorter experience and you'll have to think about how you want to schedule yours uh, when it's time for you to um, plan for your test. Where is the IELTS offered? Well, currently it is offered at 1,100 locations around the world. Often you can find the IELTS exam in major cities. Um, and the number of testing centers is growing. For the testing center closest to you, you should follow the link I've provided below to see where the most convenient location will be. There are regular testing dates each month for the IELTS, so there's no IELTS season. It doesn't happen in the fall or the summer or spring. They do offer the exam year-round, but uh, most testing centers do not offer the IELTS every single day, and so spaces are also limited. You should definitely not wait until the last minute to schedule your exam. In fact, some centers have a two-week, uh, you have to schedule your uh, exam at least two weeks ahead of the date. You should plan ahead and figure out which day you want to take the exam as early as you possibly can. How do you sign up for the IELTS? Well again, I've provided a link below for you to follow in order to uh, sign up for your test. You need to select a location and, and the date and time that you will uh, take the exam, so that's something you need to decide ahead of time. And then you fill out a simple application and you need to pay the fee. 
Uh, the fee is calculated differently, obviously, depending on where you are. Okay, but as of right now, if you're in the U.S., you'll pay 200 U.S. dollars for the exam. It costs 190 euros currently, and 115 pounds. You should check when you sign up for the exam on the current uh, pricing information. Finally, you'll have to provide a passport when you sign up for the exam. So you'll provide a copy when you, when you originally sign up. And then on exam day, you need to bring that uh, passport with you to the center to prove that you are the person you say you are. So that's one important step you'll have to follow uh, when you sign up for the exam. Okay, so that is really basic information about the IELTS. And in future lessons, we will cover more details about this exam. This lesson focuses on the format of the IELTS exam. So the IELTS has four sections. The sections called papers include reading, writing, listening, and those are all taken in one session, in one sitting. There are no breaks in the reading, writing, and listening portions of the paper exam. Then a separate section, the speaking section, you will schedule separately from your paper exam. That is an in-person interview, and you will have about 11 to 15 minutes with, your, with an examiner who will ask you questions that you need to answer for your exam. So the timing of the test, the whole thing, so both sections, the paper and the in-person interview, take two hours and 45 minutes to complete. The reading section takes one hour. The writing section takes an additional hour. Listening takes 30 minutes for, to listen to all the passages, but then you have 10 minutes after the passages are complete to transfer your answers from your question booklet to the answer sheet that you have. When we go through listening lessons, I'll describe this more in detail and talk about strategy related to this. But just know right now that the listening section has 30 minutes, but then an additional 10 at the end to transfer answers. And as we said before, the speaking section takes 11 to 15 minutes. Okay, so an important distinction for anyone taking the IELTS is whether you are taking the academic or the general training IELTS exam. If you don't know already, you definitely need to go to your institution that's requiring you to take the IELTS and figure out which version of the exam you need to take. They are both very different from each other in some ways, and in some ways they are similar. So let's talk about the two versions of the exam. So first, the similarities. <clears throat> Excuse me. Both exams have exactly the same listening and speaking sections. So you, there's no difference between the two. And in your lessons with Magoosh, when we get to those sections, there will be no division between general training topics and academic topics in the listening and speaking sections. Okay, but let's talk about the differences between the two. First, let's start with reading. So on the academic IELTS, you will have three academic articles or essays that you need to read. These will be longer in length, okay, so full articles, full essays, and each will take you approximately 20 minutes to read and answer questions. Remember, you have one hour for the reading section, so each one is expected to take you 20 minutes to read and then answer questions for. For the general training, it's different. So in the general training, the first two sections contain short reading passages, okay? So an example of a short reading passage is like a community notice or an announcement of some kind. Definitely not a full essay, like in the academic IELTS. Okay, then at the end of the general training exam, there will be one or sometimes two articles 
uh, that are a little bit longer in length. Sometimes they are academic or journalistic articles, and they're similar to the kind you would find in the academic IELTS. But you'll only have one or maybe two of these, depending on uh, the test you're taking. To see examples of the kinds of reading you will do on the academic and the general training um, IELTS exams, please look at the links below and they will take you to examples of reading passages so you know what they will look like. Okay, now further differences are in the writing section. The writing paper has two tasks for both the academic and the general training IELTS but the tasks are a little different. So in the academic IELTS, you will have for your first task to analyze data from visual information. And you'll basically need to write a report about this, uh, about what you see for the visual information, okay? So the kind of visual information they provide is usually something like this, something like a chart or a graph, or maybe two charts and graphs, you need to summarize what's there, the important information, and uh, provide some type of analysis of what's important about the visual information. In our, uh, in our writing section, we will have many examples of these types of questions and how to, answer, uh, how to answer them. Just so you're familiar now, it's this kind of task that you'll do for task one on the academic IELTS. Okay, task two is an academic essay. And um, for this one, you'll write 250 words as a minimum. For task one, the minimum was 150 words. All right, so for task two, you'll write an academic topic, uh, excuse me, you'll write an academic essay related to a topic like the one below. This essay will be, as we say, academic. It will be at least four paragraphs long with an introduction and conclusion. Again, in our writing lessons, we will go over in detail how to respond to these kinds of prompts for task two. In the academic IELTS, task one is worth one third of your points and task two is worth two thirds of your points. So it's better to spend a little more time, actually probably a lot more time on task two. Most students spend about 20 minutes on task one and then choose to spend about 40 minutes writing task two. Okay, now for the general training, task one is very different. Instead of analyzing data, like on the academic IELTS, in the general training exam, you're going to write a letter. Okay, and the task looks something like this. Okay, again, if you want to read the full uh, description here, why don't you pause your video now and read the example. For this exercise, for task one on the general training, you'll have to write a letter and they will give you ideas about what needs to be included in uh, the letter that you write. It's very important to include all the information that they request for you to provide in the letter. All right, then task two is very similar to task two on the academic IELTS where you're going to write an opinion essay to a general topic. And the topics are usually pretty similar to the academic uh, task two. Um, you'll provide some kind of opinion or perspective on an issue. Okay, finally, a few points to consider about the format of the IELTS. So the IELTS is a paper-based exam. Many exams you might take these days are on a computer, but the IELTS is on paper. So this makes a few considerations important. First of all, there's no spell checking on the IELTS exam. So you will need to have at least good enough handwriting in English that someone grading your um, exam can read what you say. This is especially important on the writing section where you're writing essays. Uh, the person who grades it needs to be able to read it. Spelling is also important. In fact, on every section of the exam, except for obviously the speaking section, you will have to write short answers, one word answers, 
And if you misspell those answers, you will lose the point. You will not get points for misspellings. So spelling is important. As you're studying vocabulary, it's very, very important to study spelling as well. Okay, timing. So for the essay section, many of you maybe these days can type a lot faster than you can write by hand. You are going to write essays in one hour, two, two essays in one hour for the IELTS exam. And it's very important that you can write quickly enough, but still have somebody understand what you are writing. It's important as you practice writing for the IELTS to write by hand. Finally, there is a, one feature of the ex, uh, IELTS exam is that you will have a question sheet and an answer sheet. If you look below, I've provided examples to answer sheets and what they look like and the question sheets as well. So as you take the exam, part of the strategy we are going to study in each section of the exam is that you will take notes and do analysis on the question sheet and then you will put your final answers on the answer, answer sheet. Okay, so hopefully this overview has given you some good ideas about what the, the exam will look like in general and then as we go forward we're going to really go into detail about each of the sections and question types. In this lesson, we will focus on scoring and what you need to know about how the IELTS is scored. So let's start with just an overview. After you take the exam, you will receive a score report. And on that report, you will have an overall score and a score for each of the four sections of the exam. Your overall score is just really your average score from the scores you receive in listening, reading, writing, speaking. Okay, I'm going to describe that a little more in detail later in this lesson. For now, just know that, that you'll receive all of those types of scores after you take the exam. And the scores will be reported in half point increments from 1 to 9. So for example, you may receive a score of 6, or you may receive a score of 6.5, okay? But there will not be other decimal points to your score. There will not be 6.75 or 6.25. Those don't occur. It's in half point increments. All right, so your scores, 1 to 9, are called band scores, all right? So what is a band score? Well, the easiest way to think about it is to look at how the IELTS defines what each band score means. Okay, so we could look, starting with band 1. A band 1 is basically a non-user of English. This person cannot really understand English, cannot speak, cannot write. Okay, this person has basically no skills in English. As you go through the bands all the way up to 9, 9 is an expert user of English. So at each step along the way from 1 to 9 is a different level of English, and each level has its own set of characteristics or defining qualities that make a person that level or the next level. If you want to see a more detailed description of each band level in general for your overall scores, go to the link directly below and uh, you can see a description from IELTS. All right, so how is band score calculated? A overall band score is just, as I said before, an average of your scores from all four sections of the exam. So for example, if this student gets a 6.5 in reading, 5.5 listening, 6 in writing, and a 7 in speaking, then we would just add all of these up and divide by 4. When you do that, you get 6.25, okay? So remember, scores are always in half point increments. So this lucky student would have their score rounded up 
to the next half point, 6.5. Okay, so how are overall scores rounded? All right, so if you average your four scores and the number ends in 0.25, it's going to round up to the next half point. See? And if your score, after it's been average, ends in 0.75, you're very lucky because your score is going to go up to the next band, right? A person who gets 6.75 will have their score rounded up to 7. Unfortunately, if your score, after it's been averaged, ends in a 1, 0.125 or lower than 0.25 that we have up here, uh, then it's going to round down. Okay, it's going to round down to the, the band score. So 6.125 average of all four sections would end up being an overall band score of 6. Okay, so what is a good score? That is a common question among students, and the answer really does depend on whatever institution it is that you plan to apply to. Different institutions have different requirements, and you should definitely check to see what your band score should be for whatever you're using your IELTS score for. So check your specific institutions. That's very, very important. Okay, but if we're looking at colleges and universities, we could say a score of 5.5 to 7.5 is considered usually a good score, and most, inst most academic institutions will set, their, will set their minimum scores somewhere in that range. Okay, let's talk about specific sections and the scoring involved in those sections. So on reading and listening sections, the scoring is very straightforward, okay? You're going to be filling in short answers and multiple choice questions, and, and the types of questions you receive in that section are, are pretty, um, pretty direct and standardized. So both sections, reading and listening, each have, will always have 40 questions, all right? And your band score for listening and reading will just be the score you received out of 40. Okay, so for example, if you receive, if you get 30 out of 40 correct in reading, all right, if you're taking the general training exam, that means you'll get a band score of six. Okay, for the academic reading section, Getting 30 out of 40 means you get a band score of 7, okay? They're different exams, and they each have their own grading criteria, okay? But uh, just know that there, it is just a table they follow, and the number of correct you get out of 40 will be your band score for that section, all right? You can see the tables for academic and general training reading scores and listening scores if you follow the links below. Writing is a little different and a little more complex. Writing is scored using what's called a rubric. Okay, a rubric is just, they use different categories to analyze your writing, and each category has things that they're looking for that they will see. Did you do this well, or did you not do this well? And if you didn't, then they're gonna move your score in that ca category down, and if you did do it well, they're going to move your score in that category up. Okay, so you, again, you can look at the rubric for writing. In general, we could describe the, the categories they're looking for in the following way. All right. The first thing they want to, in your writing is that you show coherence and cohesion. Coherence and cohesion are all about how your writing and your ideas really stick together and make logical sense together. Okay, coherence is all about how the ideas fit together. So one idea leads to the next, and it's very easy to follow what you're saying. 
And cohesion is, is about how you use words like pronouns, okay, or transition words like for example, for instance, things like that, to hold your writing together. Lexical resource is a fancy way of saying that you have a really good vocabulary and you show your vocabulary knowledge in your writing. Grammatical range means that you use a variety of structures and you use them accurately when you write. Task achievement and task response are a little different. We'll talk about both of these in the writing section in more detail, your writing lessons, but basically task achievement is for task one responses in the writing section. And that just means that you fulfilled all of the requirements for the task. You followed the directions carefully and did everything they wanted you to do. Task response means that you, it's very similar, but it means that you, um, it's for, it's, excuse me, it's for task two writing exercises. And it means that you wrote a, a good academic formal um, essay in the correct fashion. Okay, again, when we get to your writing lessons, we're going to talk about each one of these with a lot more detail. These are the four categories that they're judging your writing on. Speaking is very similar, okay? They also use a detailed rubric, and again, you can go click on the link below, uh, below the video, and you can go look at what the grading criteria are for speaking. The categories are similar to writing. They want fluency and coherence. Fluency means uh, well you're able to speak, how not really how quickly, but maybe you don't have a lot of long pauses and your ideas flow together uh, you know, easily and you, you don't struggle to come up with sentences and words a lot. Coherence means that your ideas stick together. It's just like the writing concept we just discussed. Lexical resource, the same as with writing. How well can you use vocabulary? How much vocabulary? And also, how accurately do you use the words that you use? Grammatical range and accuracy, again, about how, how much variety and how varied your grammar structures are and whether you use them correctly or whether you have a lot of mistakes. Pronunciation, basically how easily you, are, how easy it is to understand you, okay, that you don't have a lot of sounds that are really not very natural sounding in English or that cause confusion. They're looking for individual sounds and stress patterns in sentences. Okay, so to summarize, uh, the first point, after taking your exam, you will receive a score report with your overall score and, and your section scores. The overall score will just be your average score for the entire test. And scores are rounded up or down to the nearest half point. So remember how we do that depending on what your average score is and what decimal point is at the end. Most colleges and universities are looking for band scores somewhere around 5.5 to 7.5, but you need to check with your institution to see what they require. Reading and listening follow score, uh, score tables, uh, and we have links below where you can see those scoring tables. 30 out of 40 will be a band score 6 on general training, for example. And writing and speaking, uh, you just need to learn the rubrics well. So you need to know what you need to be able to do for the band score you're trying to achieve. If you're trying to achieve a seven band score in speaking or writing, go look at what is required for those and try to achieve those tasks. We'll talk about those a lot in our lessons coming up for each section of the exam. This lesson is an introduction to the reading paper on the IELTS exam. So the academic and the general training IELTS have different reading papers. So we're going to begin by looking at the important features of both exams, and then we'll finish this lesson with some comments that apply to both of them uh, just the same. Let's begin with the academic IELTS. The academic IELTS always has three articles or essays. 
three passages that you'll need to read within the one hour they give you for the exam. All of the passages are written at a college level. That means the vocabulary and the topics and the themes will all be very similar to what you would expect in a regular college course. You don't really need to be an expert in any particular subject to do well on the IELTS reading exam. They don't expect that you are an expert in biology or history or social science or anything like that. Um, really, they're not testing you on your knowledge of those subjects. They're testing you on your English. Now, even though you don't need to be an expert, you should read a lot of different kinds of materials as you prepare because you don't really know what kinds of materials you'll need to read on exam day and it will help you to have a background reading lots of different kinds of things. It's also a way to uh, learn new vocabulary that you would, would maybe not get if you just focused on one kind of reading. For example, reading a newspaper every day only. If you want to see what the reading material looks like on the uh, academic IELTS, you should follow the link below and you can look at some official materials from the exam uh, at that website. Okay, let's look at the general training now. So the general training uh, usually has three, sometimes four passages. It's a good idea if you're taking the general training exam uh, right at the beginning, right when you're starting the uh, paper, to flip back through the reading paper and look at how many passages you will need to read. Okay, is it three? Is it four? This will help you with timing and uh, really working through each one quickly. Okay, so the first passage on the general training exam is a short announcement or flyer. A flyer is uh, like something somebody would hand you on the street to give you information maybe about a new restaurant opening up or maybe something, uh, some public information that everybody needs to know. Okay, so it's very short and simple, uh, really a daily life kind of topic that you can expect for the first passage, okay? The second passage is also going to be usually sort of a daily life kind of theme or topic. Um, it's going to be informational. The point of it is not to make an argument or convince you about something. It's really just to give basic information, okay? So again, as you can probably guess, uh, these first two passages are really quite a bit simpler than an academic essay or <laughs> any type of uh, long article that you might need to read. The third and fourth, if you have a fourth passage, and uh, always the third passage, are going to be articles or essays. They're going to be longer uh, passages for you to read, and they will take you more time to complete the exercise, the uh, questions. Again, there's a link below. You can go follow that and look at example, um, example reading passages for the general training IELTS exam there. Okay, so now let's, let's look at some comments that apply to both exams. So this is just preparing for the, the uh, reading paper in general. Uh, both exams are going to require you to really think about the timing and how quickly you make it through. Um, so a first point on both exams. The passages usually get more difficult as you go. So beginning to end, the passages are going to become more challenging. There are 40 questions to answer in the, in the paper, in both papers, general training and academic IELTS, okay? So uh, you, you always know that you're going to have that number of questions for your paper. The questions at the end might take you longer, okay? so. Because the passage is more complex, the idea is that it might take you a lot longer to do those questions. So some students say, oh, well, I better go really, really, really quickly through the beginning passages, and then I'll have more time for the, for the um, questions at the end of the exam that might be harder. That's true, okay? You do probably want to spend less time on the passages at the beginning than at the end but you don't want to miss easy points 
by making mistakes at the beginning because you were rushing through. Remember, all points, all 40 points on your reading paper are worth exactly the same, okay? Question number one is worth the same as question number 40. You, you do maybe want to go faster at the beginning uh, of the paper because those questions are a little easier, but you don't want to miss those points at the beginning. You don't want to rush in a way that's going to cause you to make mistakes at the beginning. We're, as a strategy for managing time, when we get to your lessons, we're going to be talking about SUN, S-U-N. It's a method for answering reading questions on the IELTS. It stands for uh, skimming, underlining, and note-taking, and it's an approach to answering questions that will help you on exam day. For now, let's just uh, introduce this as a concept. Uh, later, when we get to your lessons, we're going to talk in detail about how it will help you to answer more quickly and to manage your time on the IELTS exam. Okay, scoring. So, as we already mentioned, each question is worth one point. They're all the equal. And you can look at, uh, at the link I put below. Uh, there is a conversion table. That's basically a table with all the score possibilities, right? So if you score 20 or 21 or 22 out of 40, what will be your band score? Well, these conversion tables will convert your score uh, depending on what you get, all right? So a 30 out of 40 will always have the same score. Now, the academic and the general training tables are a little bit different, so make sure you're looking at the right table to know what score you're trying to target uh, for the exam. Some considerations for boosting your score. First thing is, and this is true for every section of the IELTS, you need to read the task directions very closely. Each question has uh, a different set of instructions about things like how many words can you fill in for the blank or should you answer with letters or numbers or whatever the choice might be okay uh, not following the directions exactly is one easy way to lose simple simple points you don't want to do that so point number one for the reading section is to follow task directions closely Okay, another thing that you always need to focus on for your short answer questions in the, in the reading paper, but also listening and, and the writing as well, uh, spelling. So the IELTS counts you down for spelling. If you make spelling mistakes, you, need, you will get those questions wrong. Okay, so spelling is something you need to, to not just uh, push aside as a small point. It is a big point on the IELTS, especially if you're going to miss easy points because you're not spelling words correctly. The last one is that you just need to guess. If you don't know the answer to a question, you need to just guess, okay? It, there's no penalty for guessing and putting in wrong answers. So you can boost your score maybe, get another point or two if you happen to guess correctly on, let's say, a multiple choice question or something like that. Uh, never, never, never leave it blank. If you're running out of time, Go to your answer sheet and fill in questions uh, before the time is up. Hopefully, you don't have that situation, and you'll have plenty of time to go through and answer all of your questions. Okay, so this is just a very basic overview of the reading paper, but to review, so the academic IELTS, you can expect three academic passages written at a college level, right? Uh, 40 questions to answer about each of those passages in one hour. In general, the passages get harder as you go, uh, but the difference is not so great like we have in the general training IELTS where the first passages are quite a bit easier than the last two, right? So again, general training, you'll have three, maybe four passages for the general training IELTS. Um, First ones are just informational uh, about normal daily life kind of topics. And the last one will be an article or essay that's a little bit longer. 
uh, for both exams, academic and general training, time is an important factor. It is difficult to get through all of the passages and all the questions in one hour, all right? So uh, you'll need to have strategies, and that's going to be something we focus on in our lessons on the reading section. We're going to be looking at skimming, scanning. We're going to be looking at what I mentioned earlier, the SUN method, okay, S-U-N. Okay, these will be important strategies for helping you manage time on the IELTS. This lesson focuses on the listening section of the IELTS exam. Now, the academic and general training IELTS have exactly the same listening exam, so we won't need to discuss any differences between the two forms of the test. All right, so let's begin with just a really big picture uh, overview of the listening section. So on the listening paper, you can expect four passages and they, each one is a different type of passage. Passages one and two are the easiest ones, and they usually involve some type of really everyday context, some normal daily life situation. So for example, passage one is usually maybe two people and one person is helping the other person by giving some basic information, right? Maybe at the library, somebody has a question for a librarian about how to find a book, for example, and the librarian will help them. That would be an example sort of situation for passage one. Passage two is usually more informative, so it will often be some kind of expert or guide or maybe somebody giving directions. It's a really common question uh, for passage two to have a map that you need to fill in with information that somebody's providing you, maybe directions to get from one place to another. So that's usually a, a kind of thing to expect for passage two. Passages three and four are more difficult. Okay, so passage three and four are, passages three and four are usually related to some kind of academic topic. So passage three is usually a conversation so it could be a few people, maybe two or three or four, uh, discussing an academic topic. Maybe it is some students who are meeting with a tutor or a teacher, and that teacher is helping them understand a concept from class. That's a really normal situation for passage three. Passage four is uh, usually a lecture. So this is one person speaking almost always a professor, and they're giving a lecture or, a, excuse me, part of a lecture on some topic, and it could be any topic, okay? So uh, this is a challenging part. The, the vocabulary and the content will be uh, quite a bit more challenging than the first three sections. All right, if you want to see example questions for each of these four passages, just go to the link I've provided below, and you can see some official listening questions from each of these different passage types. All right, so what are some important features of the listening paper? So a few things to note. First is, you will only hear the passage once. There's no second chance to hear a passage. Different from a lot of different listening tests that you may have studied for, uh, if you've studied for the I, excuse me for the TOEFL exam, or if you've taken an English class, usually your teachers or on those exams you've had some chance to listen and take notes and think about answers. Not really for the IELTS, as we will discuss in the uh, listening lessons that we will have in this course. You need to get good at answering questions as you hear them. Okay, at the end of the 30-minute section where you're listening to your four passages, you will have 10 minutes at the end to transfer answers. So if you're taking notes and underlining and thinking about answers in your question booklet, at the, in the 10 minutes at the end of the exam, you can transfer answers over to your uh, answer sheet. All right, so this is another opportunity to plan and to do this well, and we will discuss that in your listening lessons later in the course. 
you can expect different accents, okay? The, in, the IELTS is an international exam, and there will be many different English accents represented, places like Canada, United States, the UK, Australia, etc. There will be background noise, okay, on this exam. They, if you're, somebody's giving you directions out on the street in a city, you can expect to hear car horns and people walking by. They try to make it realistic, okay? Uh, so that's the kind of thing you can expect on this, on this section. The IELTS is a difficult exam, and there are some examples of places where you might get trapped into answering the wrong way. For example, you know, they may have a speaker give what seems like the right answer to a question, and you're tempted to just write that answer down in your booklet and move on. But then the speaker changes his or her mind, and the, actually the correct answer is comes after the speaker changes her mind. Okay, that's a common kind of trap, and the IELTS is testing you to see how well you can pick it up. Again, we'll discuss that more in detail in your listening lessons. A key to success, okay, we're going to introduce this now as a concept, but then in your listening lessons we will discuss it in detail. It's what we call APT. Analyze, predict, and track. This is a method for approaching listening questions that will help you to answer them on your IELTS exam. Really, it's a way to answer questions as you hear them, which is a key strategy for the listening paper. All right, more details in your lessons. All right, so what do they test on the IELTS? IELTS tests your ability to hear detailed information, to follow in-depth arguments, so especially your passage four lecture will test you on this. It's a, really a test of vocabulary. Often the correct answers are paraphrases or synonyms of things you hear in the passage, so they're really testing your vocabulary. It's a test of your ability to follow directions and directional vocabulary, so when somebody is telling you how to get from one place to another, uh, or telling you how to do some complicated task. Uh, it's a test of that kind of material. Uh, you're tested on your ability to identify attitudes and opinions. So what does the speaker think about the topic that they are uh, describing or discussing? And they're testing you on main ideas, so your ability to find the key information in uh, a lengthy listening passage. The types of questions, well, there are many, and uh, we will talk about each type in your listening lessons, but you can expect these kinds of things. Multiple choice, matching questions, fill in a diagram, so you've got a, uh, some type of diagram or chart, and you need to listen to the speaker who will help you fill in missing information. There could be tables, okay, so a table, you know, for example, some type of list uh, could be a simple list like a grocery shopping list or a, sh a shopping list for work, something like that, and all the information is categorized and you need to fill in the right categories and the right details. Okay, that's a type of question for the listening section. You'll be completing summaries, right, so a paragraph with missing words and sentences that you'll have to complete completing sentences, okay? You can see examples of all these kinds of questions by following the link below. Uh, again, in your listening lessons, we will talk about each type in detail. Scoring for the listening, all right? So you have 40, section, 40 questions in the section, and each question is worth one point unless they tell you otherwise. And if you look at the link below, uh, there is a table you can follow that gives you information about scoring. So, you know, every score possibility, if you score 20, 21, 22, and so on, um, will give you a band score related to that particular uh, raw number that you got. Okay, so if you follow the link below, you can see those tables uh, for the listening exam. All right, on the listening section, spelling's important, and that's tough because you're not you're not reading words on the page, you're hearing them, and so you need to spell words correctly, especially on your short answer questions. And you can, you can use British or American spellings. 
uh, but you're supposed to stay consistent. So if you are um, if you are writing words, you know, many American spellings, for example, end in I-Z-E, and in British, they might end in I-S-E, okay? <laughs> so uh, either spelling for many types of words that end this way uh, would be correct, but the IELTS wants to see that you're using one system. So if you're better at American spellings, uh, use those. If you're better at British spellings, use those and try to use them consistently through the test. Okay, so to recap, there will be four types of passages that get harder from beginning to end. Okay, a key feature of the listening exam is that you listen to questions, you listen to passages and answer questions as you listen. That's the goal. Um, we're going to prepare strategies for each type of question. There are many different types of questions on this reading or on this listening paper, and you need to have strategies for all of them. Okay, so that's what we will discuss in your listening lessons. In particular, we're going to discuss a, a strategy called analyze, predict, and track, and that is an approach to answering questions as you hear them in a passage. And you should be studying official IELTS material, right? So. Uh, go follow the links below to see example listening passages, example questions, and uh, for your band score breakdown uh, so you can see what kinds of score you're shooting for. Uh, you need to get that number of questions uh, correct according to the table that's on, uh, that's on the IELTS website. Okay, so this is just a basic overview of the listening paper. Go to your listening section for much more detailed analysis of many of these different parts. This lesson introduces the speaking section of the IELTS exam. The general training and academic versions of the IELTS have exactly the same speaking section, so we don't need to discuss differences between them in this lesson. Okay, so as an overview, your speaking section is an in-person interview. You will meet with an examiner who's going to ask you questions and give you some tasks to do to uh, demonstrate your speaking ability. An interesting part of the IELTS exam is that you can take your speaking section on a different day as your paper test. Your paper test is your uh, listening, reading, and writing sections. Those you need to take on the same day. But the speaking section can be on a different day. Um, some students like to do that. They like to split up the two parts of the exam, usually because maybe they will feel more rested or focused by separating them and putting them on different days. I know other students really prefer to take them on the same day, um, and most of the time I think that's because those students want to get mentally prepared for their big IELTS day and then just get past it, get it all over with, okay? Think about what will work best for you. Um, really make your decision based on what's going to give you the best chance at a high score. So the speaking exam is not a long portion. It's only 15, 11 to 15 minutes, okay? But it is intense, all right? You are going to be speaking almost that entire time. And uh, so you, you do need to prepare for it very, very well. Um, the interviewer is going to be in control. So thinking about the time, uh, 11 to 15 minutes, your examiner needs to get through all the, the different parts of the exam in a very short amount of time. So your examiner is going to be in control of the time. Uh, he or she may cut you off or maybe uh, ask you to change topics or ask a, uh, answer a different question before you feel that you've answered something completely and fully. Um, the reason the examiner is doing that is because he or she needs to get through everything, right? So you shouldn't be worried about it or uh, get upset about when, if the examiner is pushing things in a way that you feel is maybe unnatural. Uh, they're not trying to be rude, they're just trying to control the time, right? The examiner will ask you the questions they want to hear, 
your only job is not to worry about what they're doing, but just worry about answering the, their questions the best you can. Okay, so let's look at the exam format. What can you expect? Well, there are three sections to the speaking test. Section one is the easiest part of the exam. Um, the questions are going to just be about basic personal information um, about your family, questions about your hometown, maybe your hobbies or academic interests, places you've traveled, that kind of thing will be uh, what, what the examiner will ask you to discuss. This part lasts four to five minutes, and really you should think about it as kind of a warm-up section for parts two and three, which do get more challenging. Um, so just answer the simple questions the best you can. If you've been speaking English for a while and using it uh, in your life in any, any capacity at all, you probably have discussed these topics that will come up in part one of the exam. Okay, so a monologue is the part two. A monologue is basically another word for a speech, right? You're going to give a very short speech. So here's how it works. The whole section, the whole part two, lasts about three to four minutes. You're going to have uh, a card that your examiner gives you, and on the card is going to be a topic. All right, you have one minute to prepare uh, a, a short speech based on the topic and the points that you need to discuss on that card. Okay, so you'll take a minute, you'll brainstorm, you'll plan a little bit, and then you'll speak, you'll give your monologue for about one to two minutes. After that, your examiner will probably ask you some follow-up questions about what you said. Okay, section three then is the most challenging section. Here, the, the interview will resume, okay, and for about four to five minutes, your examiner is going to ask you more follow-up questions about the topic that you discussed in section two, but now the questions are going to get more challenging. Um, your examiner is going to ask you for your perspective, your opinion about uh, a, ver a variety of things, and you're going to have to answer with more complicated, uh, more complicated responses because they are longer and more detailed, and the questions the examiner will ask you will require more, uh, uh, more advanced vocabulary, more advanced grammar in order to answer them successfully. Okay, the questions tend to be more abstract, all right, and the topics just a little more uh, complex. In our in our speaking lessons, we will focus on section three of the exam, uh, so that you know how to answer those questions the best you can. All right. For now, you should go to the link below to take a look at some sample IELTS uh, speaking questions, and they offer some. Uh, example responses from students as well uh, in order to sort of see what the an questions and answers look like for each of these sections. Okay, let's very quickly talk about scoring. We will talk, we will describe scoring uh, in much more detail in the speaking lessons, all right, but just so you get an idea. The following criteria are used to assess your speaking. Criteria is another word uh, for just sort of what kinds of factors or what kind of measurements are they looking at when they're trying to assess how well you speak. All right, so these are the four sets of measurements they're using. They're going to try to measure your fluency. How smoothly do you uh, speak? Do you really have a lot of pauses where you're looking for words and you don't really know how to describe an idea? or can you speak very fluently and uh, quickly and really express ideas in an easy way without a lot of effort, okay? Coherence is your ability to connect ideas together. So all of your ideas make sense and flow together in a very logical way. Lexical resource is a really fancy way of saying you have a really good vocabulary. So lexical resource is a measurement of your vocabulary. 
Grammatical range, how many, how, uh, how many different grammatical structures can you use? How complex uh, is your knowledge of, of English grammar? And how easily and fluently can you use grammatical structures uh, accurately when you speak? Pronunciation is the last one. And uh, for pronunciation, you don't really need to worry about um, your accent. It's not about accent, okay? Everybody, almost everybody who takes the IELTS speaking section has some kind of accent, which is just the normal influence of your native language on your speaking in English. Um, no, pronunciation is more about whether or not you have problems that make you difficult to understand. Sounds that do not really sound like uh, English at all or uh, words you mispronounce, okay? Uh, any, any patterns in your speaking that really make it tough for your examiner to comprehend what you're saying, that can be a problem on the, on the IELTS. Check out below uh, the speaking criteria. I've put a link there to the IELTS exam. There you can go and look at the different band levels, right? So, so band six, band seven, or eight, whatever you're targeting, and look at each of these different, uh, these four different ways that they're measuring your speaking ability. And you can see in detail what they expect for each band level uh, on the exam. Okay, a final important point is that the examiner is not scoring you on your ideas, okay? So the examiner is not going to check whether or not what you said is true or false, okay? Um, you shouldn't say things that seem unreasonable or unusual or strange, but you, you don't always need to give your true opinion or say um, things that are 100% factually uh, factual. If it's easier for you to say <laughs> something that maybe isn't exactly true, uh, you should do that on the speaking section because uh, really your examiner does not care or, and will not check with if, whether your, uh, your statements are true or false. Okay, so how to do well on the speaking exam. First one is to answer questions directly. You need to answer the question that has been asked of you. You need to limit long pauses or, or confusing speech, right? So this is about fluency. You need to be able to speak without really struggling to find the words and, and the, the appropriate thing to say. You need to show off your vocabulary. You need to have a wide-ranging vocabulary on the speaking exam to do really, really, really well, okay? Really, this is about avoiding repeating the same words over and over or just simply using very basic vocabulary the whole time, okay? On the other side, you should not use vocabulary you're not really comfortable with. If you don't really have a strong sense of how to use a word, you shouldn't use it in you shouldn't use it on your speaking section because if you do use it incorrectly your examiner will notice you need to use a lot of different grammar structures okay you don't need to worry about this very much the questions your examiner asks you uh, will require you to use a variety of grammar okay so it's not something you need to really be thinking about directly as as you're taking the exam um, but if you have problems with your grammar, uh, you should be studying grammar steadily before your exam day so you can do better and better on the speaking test. Okay, you'll need to practice timing, especially for part two of the exam. So practice uh, with, with example question cards, taking one minute, preparing an answer, and then giving a short speech. You should do that over and over and over. And again, when we get to your speaking lessons, I'll give you advice on how to practice for section two. La uh, another point, you want to avoid topics and ideas you don't know how to discuss. Okay, this is about that point, uh, you know, your examiner isn't going to check whether or not what you say is factual. Okay, if, if your examiner asks you a question about, let's say, your hobby, and you don't know how to discuss your hobby in English, 
uh, you should really avoid that topic and maybe think of something you can describe. If you don't know how to discuss your true hobby, then maybe you should say something like soccer or swimming or going to the beach, whatever it is that you can describe better uh, and, and that you'll be able to speak more fluently about. That's a better choice, okay? So don't get into things that you don't really know how to describe to the best of your ability on exam day, okay? Last point here, don't use memorized language, especially for part one. I know some students have gone in and tried to memorize uh, a little monologue, little, uh, you know, example sentences of things they could say about their family or their interests or things like that. It's perfectly fine to study, uh, you know, dialogues and other, you know, basic scenarios that you might encounter, especially for part one. But don't go into exam day and expect that you will be able to use memorized language. The problem with memorized language is that you are going to have a problem answering questions directly. And if your examiner thinks that you are using memorized language, he or she will definitely count you, your score down. So don't, don't study that way. You need to study to be prepare uh, to speak fluently to the questions that are asked of you on your exam. Okay, so to review. The IELTS speaking section is an in-person interview with three sections, okay? Your only job on all three sections is to demonstrate your fluency. The three parts of the test are part one with the basic questions and, and topics about you. Part two is a monologue or a short speech where you give a res uh, responses to a prompt on a card. And the third part is a more in-depth discussion, more complicated questions about the topic that you uh, gave a speech about in part two. Go and study the criteria for, your, uh, for the exam. Go look at the link below. You can find detailed information about how each of the band levels is scored, and you should know and have a sense of what they're expecting for the band level that you are trying to achieve. Okay, so that is our overview of the speaking section. Go to the speaking lessons to find more detailed strategies and tips for each of these points. Let's take a look at the writing paper so you know what to expect in this section of the test. The writing paper for the general training and academic IELTS are different, so we will cover some of those differences in this overview of the section. First, some basics. So the writing section has two basic tasks that you'll have to complete, and you have one hour to complete both of them. You can start with whichever task you like. You can start with task one or task two. That's really up to you. Task one is a shorter one and task two is a longer one. So when we get to our writing section, we can discuss strategy for which one to choose first. One thing to note is that task one is worth fewer points than task two. Task one is worth one third and it's a shorter task, and task two is worth two-thirds of your writing score, and it is worth more points. So you can imagine you should spend a much shorter time on task one than you do on task two. Most people spend 20 minutes on the first task and 40 minutes on the second task. Okay, let's talk about some differences between the academic and general training writing tests. So for the academic, you're going, your task one, you're going to report some information from charts, graphs, or diagrams. So the questions look like this. You're going to have a chart that you're looking at, and it'll tell you to summarize the information by selecting and reporting main features, and to make comparisons where relevant. This task is not one where you have to give opinions or state any perspectives at all. You just need to write a report from the information they provide. Task two, then, is an opinion or argument essay. This is your chance to demonstrate your opinion on a topic that they provide you. So you'll write an essay. Here's an example question. So if you look down below, this would be a typical thing you'd write about. 
the number of car accidents has steadily increased since 2000. New regulations should be passed, raising the minimum driving age and making driver training courses more challenging. To what extent do you agree or disagree? Okay, so this is an opportunity to provide a perspective. There's never a right or wrong answer. You just need to take a perspective and write an essay on it. In our writing lessons, we will take a very close look at how to write these, this kind of essay and how to organize it. For general training, instead of writing a report based on a chart like you do for the academic test, for general training task one, you write a letter. You will have a prompt uh, that gives you the topic of the letter, and you'll have to follow a particular style of letter as you're writing to somebody that the test tells you to write to. For example, you may be writing to a friend or a boss you may be writing to a letter of complaint to a company, so you can imagine there will be different styles of letters depending on who you're writing to. Here is a sample prompt for a task one letter. You can read it here. You just got hired for an excellent job. The college courses you took were very helpful because you learned the skills and knowledge you need to do the job well. Write a letter thanking your college professor for teaching you so well. In the letter, describe your new job, explain your course, explain how your course with this prof professor prepared you for the job, and explain why this job is a perfect fit for you. Okay, these are the things at the bottom here that you're supposed to include in the letter. All right, we will cover this in detail, how to write these letters if you are taking the general training exam, but just uh, a sample prompt here to let you know what to expect. For task one, you may have a letter like we saw, thanking someone, or you may be complaining, requesting something. It could be a personal letter or a very formal letter. And the IELTS expects you to know language you would use to write these kinds of letters. Task two for the uh, general training IELTS is just like academic task two. You're going to write an opinion essay. Okay, very quickly on scoring, we will have a whole lesson on scoring in your writing lessons. So I just want to cover very quickly how the IELTS writing is scored, and then you can look to that other lesson for more detail. There are four scoring categories. One is task achievement and task response. For tasks one and two, these are just about how well did you follow the directions for the task. You are scored on coherence and cohesion. These categories are all about how well your ideas stick together. Do you logically connect sentences together, one to the next? Do you use pronouns and other kinds of linking and transition words to pull uh, ideas together in your, um, in your writing? That's what coherence and cohesion is about. Lexical resource, this is a fancy name for a basic way to say, how well do you use vocabulary? Do you, do you use many words, or are you, do you have some redundancy? Redundancy is when you use the same words over and over, and you'll be scored down for that. Uh, so the IELTS is looking for how well you use a wide range of vocabulary. And it's the same for grammar. They want to see you using grammar accurately and using a range of grammatical structures. Okay, so um, you can follow the link below. Go look at the scoring criteria in detail. Each band level has a different set of considerations for each of these four areas. Okay, so you can go there and study that. Okay, so how to get a good score, just some basic tips here that we will, again, cover in more lessons down, uh, in your writing section. Um, you need to answer the prompts directly, okay, so you need to show that you understood the task and the question and you provided a direct response to those prompts. You need to respond to the entire prompt. You saw the letter writing prompt for the general training, for example, has several things you're supposed to do. You need to do all of them for each of the writing tasks. You will have to practice managing your time. 20 minutes is not a long time for task one, and 40 minutes is not a long time for task two. So part of your preparation will be 
planning for the very short amount of time that you have. As you practice writing, you will definitely need to have your watch there and time yourself so you're doing all of these things in the correct amount of time. You will just need to practice a lot, okay? You'll need a lot of practice questions and you'll need to practice many essays in revising and editing them. It's an important thing to do to prepare so that you're ready for your exam. And make sure that your practice is authentic. Try to copy the exact format of the test whenever you can. We already talked about timing, but also make sure you're doing things like practicing your writing by hand, using a pencil instead of typing your answers. It will not help you to improve your writing in the way it should if you're typing your answers. You need to practice writing by hand to make sure that your handwriting is going to be quick enough and that you can read it and that your examiner can read it on exam day. Okay, the basic point is try to copy the features of the test exactly. And for the letter assignment for general training students, the format of those letters is very important. For task two on both exams, you need to really be good at writing five paragraph essays, four to five paragraph essays with introduction, body, and conclusions. We will cover all of these topics in our lessons on the writing section. Okay, so to review, IELTS writing involves completing two tasks in an hour. Task one is 150 word minimum, and it's worth one third of your points. Task two is a 250 word minimum, worth two thirds of your points. So for timing, most people spend 20 minutes on task one and 40 minutes on task two. Go to the scoring criteria that I've included on the link below and practice responding to prompts using the real test format as much as possible. Okay, so we will have much more on the writing section in our writing lessons. What's the best way to study for the IELTS exam? The answer to that question depends a lot on you. Uh, on your English level, on how much time you have, on what kind of band score you're hoping to achieve, right? So everybody's study plans will be a little bit different. In this lesson, I'm just going to give you some advice about different aspects of your study that you should focus on in order to get the most out of your studies and to make a realistic plan for you. Okay, so we're going to focus on two basic elements of IELTS study in this lesson. The first is just learning the exam, learning the test. This involves learning about format, right? The different types of questions, what the directions will be, all of that kind of thing. It'll be related to strategy, so how to approach each type of question in the best way possible. It'll also be about timing, right? How uh, to manage your time in, let's say, the reading section, where timing is extremely limited, or how to understand how to take the full test, the long two hour and 45 minute test without any breaks, right? You need practice with that kind of thing before you really understand or know how well you're gonna do at it. So if your English skills are already as strong as you want them to be, okay, and all you really need is to learn about the test, most students will take about one to three months in order to really learn the test deeply. After that amount of time, you'll have enough practice where you can really, on test day, know that you understand the test fully. Okay, some of you have less time than that, others may want to take more, but one to three months is what it takes most students to achieve that goal. Now, if you need to develop your English skills, so not just learn about the test, but really get better at speaking or maybe at writing or, or at everything, right? If your English needs to be stronger to get the band score you need, then it's going to take you more time. You're going to have to get experience doing the things in English that you need to work on. In other words, if you need to be a better speaker to speak more fluently, that won't happen 
obviously, unless you get a lot of experience speaking. So if that's your case and you need to really develop your English skills, it's going to take you longer. It's going to take you months, maybe years to get where you need to be. It's important to be realistic about this and to make a plan for how you will get the right experience to improve in the areas that you're weakest at. All right, so let's get some more detailed and specific advice about these two areas, right? Learning about the test and learning English. Okay, so for learning the format, for learning about how the test is structured and the different kinds of questions on the exam, the best thing you can do is to study official practice materials, right? IELTS produces practice questions that they put on their website. They also have full-length pra practice exams that they offer in book form. I've got a link to some blog posts below that give you uh, the sources for these uh, and places to find these resources, okay? Look there for the official resources. You need to study real practice exam questions because those teach you the format better than any other type of question you can find. They're created by the test creators themselves. Some of them are even maybe real exam questions that have been used before. That's where you need to look to learn the exam format. Now, official materials are not as good for test strategy. They're good for practicing, all right? So you can practice your strategies with official materials. But to learn strategies, it's better to go to unofficial sources. Here in your lessons with Magoosh, we're going to be studying lots of different strategies and different ways to approach the exam. That's one source. You may want to look for others as well, books, other resources you can find online. Again, in the blog post below, uh, there are some ideas for you to go look out those kinds of sources. For timing, here's where we want to go back to those official materials, right? Your, this incl timing includes stamina, and stamina is your ability to take a long test, right? This long two-hour, 45-minute test with no breaks. You need to practice the real materials with real timing, right? You can't just study an exercise here or one section here or there and expect to really know how you're going to do the timing of the exam. At some point, you need to take full-length exams, okay? So these can be from official materials, that's best, but you can also use unofficial ones. You need to take as many practice exams as you can. Not every day, you'll get tired, you'll hate it, okay? But you need to take some full-length practice exams regularly as you prepare for your real IELTS test. Okay, then for learning English, so what can you do? What kind of resources should you look for? Well, probably most of you, if you really need to develop your English, you're taking some kind of English class. How long is your class? Maybe an hour or two? Some of you may have a longer day of English classes if it's an intensive program. That's great. You should also, as you prepare for the IELTS, look for places you can practice outside of the classroom. Are you watching TV or listening to English radio, right? Are you listening to sources from around the world? Australia, Canada, United States, the UK. Many different play accents are represented on the exam, and you need to go seek them out, right? Are you looking for me? Are you looking to meet native speakers? Are there clubs you can join? Are there is there somebody who could give you feedback on your writing? You need to be looking actively for resources outside your classroom to practice as much as possible. Okay, you should not just be focusing on grammar. Grammar exercises are helpful, sure, but they're not enough. You are going to be tested on how you use English on your IELTS exam, so you need to practice those things and get experience practicing. You should also be really focusing on your weakest skills. What is it for you? Is it writing? Is it speaking? You should be targeting that skill directly and getting extra help with it. 
Are there native speakers where you are? Can you find some somebody, even if you have to just get a conversation partner? online, right? Can you find some way to interact with native speakers as you prepare? It's a really important thing to do, especially for speaking and for getting feedback on your writing. As you practice listening material, you should, especially if you're taking the academic IELTS, focus on a high level, right? Academic sources are good. Um, good journalistic resources are important too. Again, in the blog post below, I've got some ideas for resources that you can use to really read and listen the type of material that will be on the IELTS exam. The goal is to focus your practice, to learn vocabulary, to learn the kinds of language that will be on the exam so you're prepared to the best of your ability. The purpose of this video is to help students who only have about one to three weeks to study for IELTS to create a study schedule that is going to meet your needs and help you the most to do the best you can on the exam. Now we have one week and one month study schedules posted in the notes below this lesson and you should certainly refer to those. But everybody's needs and everybody's timing is a little bit different, okay? Uh, you may not have a few hours every day to study. You may only have a short time. Or you may have quite a bit of time in the next uh, couple of weeks to devote to IELTS study. And, and maybe you can do more than what's listed there. So the purpose of this video is to help you to think about how to prioritize your studying and what you should focus on as you prepare in one to three weeks for the IELTS. Okay, so for you students that have one to three weeks to study, your top priority is to learn about the test, okay? You need to know what to expect in each of the four sections, okay? So you need to learn about them. We've got introductory videos that, that will introduce you to important elements of each of the four sections. But of course, you should also look through uh, sample tests, okay? Uh, and sample questions to know what to expect on the different parts of the test. Okay, what's the timing, for example, of the writing section. Okay, you've got an hour, but to only 20 minutes is for task one and 40 minutes is for task two. Okay, all of that kind of information you need to know in order to do your best on each of the four sections. Okay, so study all of those basic videos and lessons that we have uh, and really learn about what you can expect on all four sections of the exam. All right, now you should also uh, learn about each of the question types, especially for listening and reading, where there are a variety of different questions, and each one has its own kind of unique way for you to answer, and uh, so you need to be very familiar with those, okay? So um, you, should, you should, when you get to the reading section, be able to see a true, false, not given question, for example, and you should know exactly what you're supposed to do strategically to answer those questions. On the listening section, you should know how to answer uh, short answer questions, for example, uh, the ones where you have word limits that you have to follow very closely. All right, all of the basic information is really critical to know about each of the question types. So focus your attention on learning, taking as many practice questions questions as you can and watching the videos as well to learn about the question types and strategies for each one. Okay, uh, the next priority for you is to learn about scoring, okay, especially uh, I think the writing and speaking section where they use the band score descriptors uh, that kind of, it's a rubric that, that indicates each of the band score levels. You should know that very well. We've got examples of those linked below and they're also linked in many of your other videos in each of those sections. So you should get to know those and as you do practice questions for speaking and writing, you should try to study those and if at all possible get feedback from someone about how they think you did according to the IELTS rubric. Uh, a native speaker of course would be ideal for that situation but if you've got a study partner or if you're just uh, scoring yourself you should spend some time thinking about how the speaking and writing sections are scored and then of course the reading and and listening too uh, although that's just a standardized test where the number of questions you get correct uh, will indicate your score okay anyway uh, learn about scoring so that you know how your band score 
uh, is calculated on the test. All right, finally then, um, you should practice and learn about the various strategies for timing, especially in the reading section. Okay, the reading section, as if you haven't watched any of the uh, reading videos yet, you will learn the reading section is very difficult to complete in the, time, uh, in the time they give you. 60 minutes is not a lot of time to get through all the articles, all the essays, and answer all of the questions. So you need a strategy, okay? We've got uh, lessons on those strategies, and these lessons are important ones for you to watch and to practice in order to manage your time on the reading. Okay, similar with writing, okay, you've only got a very short amount of time to plan your essays, to write them, and to do editing at the end. So your job in the next couple of weeks is to learn about timing strategies and to practice them before the test, okay? All right, in addition to these things, you should try in the next couple of weeks to take two full-length practice tests, if at all possible. If you can take more, that's great. Please remember that you should try to recreate the exam conditions as closely as you can. That means you need to have about two hours and 40 minutes to take the reading, writing, and listening uh, papers all together, all at the same time, okay? Because that's what it's going to be like for you on exam day. The speaking section is scheduled separately, so you can take a break or do what you need to do before you take the speaking section. But for your full-length exams, if at all possible, try to get the at least the timing exactly the same, okay? It also means, for the writing section, you should not be typing your answer. When you write practice tests, you should be writing them by hand. Okay, these things are important. This gets you ready for the test day and what the experience of taking the full test will be like. So try to take at least two full length exams and if you can do more, that's fantastic, okay? Every day you should be doing practice questions, okay? Do as many as you can, especially listening and reading questions. The more you do, the more you'll get familiar with those question types. So make sure that that's something you do every single day, okay? All right, so to review, if you have one to three weeks to study, your job is to learn about the test. Learn about the IELTS exam, the basic information so that you know what to expect. You should do daily practice questions from all four sections of the exam. And if possible, you should try to complete two mock exams in the one to three weeks that you have, okay? I would prioritize these things over doing things to try to develop your English skills generally. It, you don't have enough time to really make big improvements to your English skills if you only have one to three weeks. So instead of spending hours on grammar study or on vocabulary study or any of these other things, uh, I would, if your time is very limited, focus on just learning about the test in the next couple of weeks. Okay. With all of that, if you put in the time, uh, even though it's a short amount of time, a couple of weeks, you can learn a lot and it can really help your score to know about the exam. Okay, so good luck with your studies. This lesson is for students who have about four to eight weeks to study for the IELTS exam to help you create a study schedule that's going to work for you. Now we have a one month schedule uh, posted below and you should certainly use that as a resource, uh, but everybody's got a different amount of time and everyone has different needs. Uh, some people out there will only have a, a couple hours during the week where you can study. Others will have a lot of time you can devote. Some people's needs are much greater. You have to try to make big improvements in maybe the writing section or the speaking section. Uh, so you have to, everybody's needs will be different and we have to find a way to create a study schedule that's going to work for you. So the purpose of this video is to help you think about what is the most important information you need to know about the test, what are the most important things you need to practice and study over the next four to eight weeks so you can do the best you can on exam day. Okay, so let's take a look. 
Students who have four to eight weeks, well, the first thing you should prioritize is learning about the test, okay? You need to know about the exam and, and what, the, what the timing is like, what the directions are like, uh, what, you know, what you can expect in the speaking section. All of the details related to the format of the test are things that you should know well. Okay, now luckily you have plenty of time to learn about this stuff. So... The things to prioritize, knowing about what to expect in the, each of the four sections, learning about question types and their directions, learning how the sections are scored, and developing timing strategies, especially for the reading and writing sections. If you go through your Magoosh videos and in four to eight weeks you've got plenty of time to make it through almost through all of them, almost all of them, uh, if, you, if you have time to devote each day. Uh, you will learn about the test and the very and the various things here that you need to know. Okay, so this is a, a, a priority for everyone and anyone who's got four to eight weeks to study. Just knowing the basic information about the test and what to expect in each of the four sections. Okay, now part of that training also involves doing lots of practice questions. By doing questions, you really learn about the different question types. You get to practice the various strategies you learn about and how to take those questions and, and uh, how to answer them best. So doing daily practice questions, no matter what you do, you should do at least a few listening and reading practice questions every day in order to prepare. Okay, so learning about the test doing practice questions and just uh, and just really studying about the IELTS exam in the four sections. Again, this is all information you can get if you make it through all or almost all of the Magoosh videos we have here. All right, now, there are some more things you can do with four to eight weeks to help boost your score, okay, beyond just learning about the exam. You should study vocabulary every day, for example. Four to eight weeks is a lot of time to make improvements to your, uh, to your vocabulary. There's a separate video we have about keeping a vocabulary journal. Look at that one and try to institute some of the practices there that you, that you uh, learn about in that video. Uh, it involves keep, you know, keeping close track of new vocabulary and trying to learn you know, 10 to 15 new words every day. This should be your goal because uh, imagine if you've got two months to study and you learn 15 new words every day, you've got a lot of a big pool of new vocabulary you can use in your writing and your speaking and and that you can understand in the other sections as well. Okay, so vocabulary should be a big goal of yours every day. Study vocabulary and keep a journal. You should try to take a lot of practice tests. Take mock tests if you if you can. Uh, one each week would be ideal if you can get at least one practice test. Maybe Saturday mornings are your time to take uh, IELTS tests. It can really help you, not only just for the English practice that it gives you, but also just to learn about the test. Remember, when you take mock tests, when you take practice tests, make sure to recreate the exam conditions. You should try to take the reading, writing, and listening sections all at once, and it should take you about two hours and 40 minutes to do those. You can take a break then and do the, the speaking section later if you like, because that's what you'll experience on the real exam. Um, but it's this kind of training where you're trying to mimic and, and recreate the timing and the conditions of the test the cl as close as you can that can really help you train for the real thing, the real exam. Okay. Uh, focus on writing and speaking improvement. You can make big improvements to your writing and speaking during this, even this short amount of time, four to eight weeks. Uh, you can do things like in your writing and your speaking. You can improve these little grammar errors that you make. If you're recording your responses to the IELTS questions for speaking, listen to them. Listen to them a few times and listen for little mistakes that you make and try over time to improve your ability to catch those mistakes before you make them. The same thing with writing. You should go and edit your essays and learn from the editing process. Again, we've got a whole lesson on essay editing and how to learn from editing your practice uh, essays. Watch that video and try to learn from it because you can really make big improvements even if you're just 
you're not even in a cl English class. You're just kind of, you're working on your own. You're self-studying. You're paying attention to the persistent mistakes you make. Over the course of four to eight weeks, you can make a big improvement to your language ability, your accuracy, and your fluency, okay? Speaking of fluency, you should speak English as much as you can, okay? If, if you don't have a lot of opportunities to use your English on a daily basis, then you need to create opportunities for yourself. Can you give little short speeches to your, to your friends or your family at home in English, right? Maybe two to three minute speeches every day. The practice you put into speaking on a regular basis, even if it's just in front of the mirror, if you have nobody to, to converse with in English, do that a little bit every day because it will help your fluency, your ability to use your English rapidly and fluently, and that can help your score on the exam. So as much speaking practice as you can fit in to your schedule, the better. Okay, uh, you should also do a little bit of writing every day. You don't have to write a full essay uh, every single day. Nobody's going to want to do that. Uh, that's too much uh, and takes too much time from most people. But if you look down below in the notes, I've got a, um, a, a document there on our blog that you can look at that gives you ideas about English language development exercises that you can do on your own. And one of the exercises that I really love is called a 15 minute writing exercise. Okay, you can you can find that in that document you see down below. 15 minutes of writing that's directed and that's useful for you to improve your writing fluency, your speed, and hopefully uh, also to, to work on those errors we discussed earlier, finding problems, mistakes. If you can put in 15 minutes of writing every day and if you go through that, that exercise and uh, look at your writing, analyze it, try to improve it the next time, over the course of four to eight weeks, you can make some big improvements on your writing skills. Okay, so a little bit of writing practice also goes a long, long way in four to eight weeks. All right, lastly then, uh, one recommendation, even though, you know, in four to eight weeks, you're not going to make giant improvements in your essay writing ability. It takes time to learn how to write essays really well. You can make big improvements to your essay organization. Go to the videos we have on the lessons we have on each of the uh, task two question types. There are questions uh, that ask you, you know, to what extent do you agree or disagree, okay? Or um, discuss both sides and give your opinion. Okay, learning how to organize those essays um, and so that they are logical, so that each of the paragraphs you write makes sense together, that uh, type of practice and that skill is one you can learn easily in four to eight weeks if you have, uh, if you if you put in the time to learn about it and practice those essay types. Um, and your organization can make big uh, improvements to your coherence and cohesion scores and your task response and task achievement scores in your writing. So it's very worthwhile to boost your score. Okay, so essay organization is a big priority for you and it's something you can make improvements on in the next couple of weeks. Okay, to review, no matter how much time you have on a daily basis the next four to eight weeks, there are some things you should prioritize as you create your own study schedule. You need to, of course, learn about the test, uh, learning the basic information, scoring, di question directions, all of those things. Uh, that's a huge priority for you in the next couple of weeks. You should be doing practice questions every day, at least a few, okay? If you don't have much time on a particular day, see if you can just answer one set of listening and reading questions. Even if it's just a few questions, uh, it's worthwhile to keep going with it and, and build that into your daily routine, if at all possible. You should be studying vocabulary every day and keeping a vocabulary journal. Try to really improve your vocabulary in the next four to eight weeks by regularly uh, collecting words and studying them as well. You should try to fix your persistent grammar errors for the speaking and writing sections, okay? That means recording your speaking responses and it means editing and analyzing your essay responses, trying to look for mistakes, little things, uh, you know, verb tense errors, subject verb agreement, articles, little things that you 
know the rules for that you can fix, okay? That, that you don't have to learn a lot of new grammar. It's probably not possible to learn lots and lots of new grammar in the next four to eight weeks with all the other things you need to study. So focus on what you can do, okay? And that means trying to fix those errors that constantly come up in your speaking and writing. Okay, and you should be speaking and writing as much as possible. It does not have to be full essays or full speaking practice tests every day. If you can just build in a little bit of time every day to write and to speak a little bit in English, over the next four to eight weeks, you can make big improvements to your fluency, to your accuracy, to your ability to respond to a variety of questions on a variety of topics. Many benefits to this daily practice if you can build that in. Okay, so these are your priorities. You students who have four to eight weeks, this is what you should focus on as you prepare for the big day. This lesson is for students who have more than eight weeks to study for the IELTS exam. Many students have about two to six months, and that's uh, a longer term student. Some, some of you have more than six months even, which is uh, great because you have lots and lots of time to study for the test and to do other things as well. So everybody's time is different. Your schedule is different from everyone else's. We have study schedules, and you see a one month study schedule below and a language development study schedule. I'll be talking about those in this lesson. But you're going to have to do some work to, to create your own schedule that fits your needs and your time constraints, okay? So the purpose of this lesson is to help you think about what are the most important priorities when you are creating your study schedule. Okay, so let's think about this a little bit. So for you who have more than two months to study for the IELTS, so the first thing you need to do, and this is true for every student, okay, uh, that's studying for the exam, is you need to learn about the test. You need to know what to expect in each of the four sections. You need to learn about the question types and their directions. You need to learn how each section is scored. And you need to develop your timing strategies, especially for the reading and writing section. Okay, since you have more than eight weeks, more than two months to study for the test, this is something you have a lot of time to do, all of these things, okay? If you go through your, uh, if you go through all your lesson videos and if you take uh, a lot, if you spend time working on practice questions uh, over the course of the entire time you have to study for IELTS, if you're looking at that material regu regularly, you have plenty of time to master all of this content. Okay, so, uh, in addition to just learning about the exam, you should be taking practice questions. Take a few every day, okay? Since you have so much time, you know, you don't have to take lots and lots of questions every day. Just regular practice. Can you build it into your routine uh, to take, you know, a few sets of reading questions and to answer a few sets of listening questions every day? You know, maybe a half hour or 45 minutes. Some days you'll want to spend longer, okay? Especially, of course, days where you take practice practice tests, you'll be t doing much more than that. But this, these two things, okay, working on these daily practice questions a little bit each day, and what you do to learn about the test, of course, these things work together, okay? They, uh, when you do the practice questions, you apply the knowledge you're learning from the lesson videos, and you learn over time through repeated practice. Okay, so that's sort of priority number one. Again, since you have so much time, you have, uh, you have plenty of time to space out your practice questions and your lesson videos to learn about the test over this period of time. Okay, now, in addition to learning about the exam, a few other things. Since you have so much time, you need to focus on your vocabulary development, okay? This is very important. On all four sections of the exam, you can really boost your score by adding a lot of vocabulary to your uh, repertoire, to your uh, active vocabulary, your ability to recognize and use these words. And the best way to do that is to keep a vocabulary journal, to do a systematic study of vocabulary. We have a whole lesson on keeping a vocabulary journal, so I'm not going to talk about it uh, a long time here. Uh, I highly recommend, if, you're study if you can learn 10 to 15 new words every day over the course of uh, the, the months that you have to study for the test, 
Then think about how many words you can add to your vocabulary over this time. Make it part of your daily routine to study vocabulary and keep a journal so that you are studying it in a systematic way. Okay, you should also be taking regular practice tests. Now, since you have so much time, um, I recommend the following kind of program. Take a full length test very early, maybe in the first week of your program that you're, that you're following. Uh, this helps you to know uh, how you're doing and what you what you know and what you don't know about the test. It also it's very informative to take a full length test to give you a sense of your timing. Uh, many students find on the writing section, for example, that you uh, really aren't close to being able to write two essays in one hour and hit the minimum word count number. Okay, that's information for you that you need to work on your writing speed, and you get that early in your program so that you can work on those things over time. So take a, take a full length test early and then maybe every two or three weeks I recommend taking a full length exam. Okay, find a time maybe Saturday or Sunday morning. You can take the time, the, the hours that it takes uh, and, you, and you really should try to recreate exam conditions when you take the test. So uh, get a good three hour window where you can take the exam, a practice exam just like it's going to be with the timing of the real exam on exam day. Um, then, during the last month of your program, I recommend taking one practice test each week, okay? So, don't burn out, don't take practice tests every week for the whole entirety of your program. You'll, you'll get really fatigued, tired uh, from doing that. Most students would. Uh, if you have the energy to do that, go ahead. It's, of course, it's not going to hurt you. But I, I think two to three, um, every two to three weeks is enough. And then the last month of your preparation, uh, try to speed up and, and do a few more. Okay, now, here's the big thing for you students with more than eight weeks to study. You can do a lot in addition to your vocabulary we talked about earlier. You can do a lot to really build your English skills. Okay, so not just learning about the test, but actually getting better at English. Okay, here are my recommendations. If at all possible, if you have more than two months, consider taking English classes. Do what you need to do to find a conversation partner, maybe in person or even online. Get a tutor. You can make real advances in maybe your speaking fluency or your ability to write clearly, okay? Those things can, can be dramatically improved if you get a little bit of help with your English skills. So consider that if you've got the time. I don't recommend that for students who have a much shorter program because there just isn't time to learn all of the, the different things that go into, let's say, improving your grammar or really making a dramatic difference in your speaking fluency. But you, students who have more time, can make big gains. If you have the time and if you can, uh, if you can get some help often, you can make some big gains in your English uh, abilities during this time. Uh, so consider also some in-depth in grammar review. Uh, if you don't have a teacher, you don't sign up for a class, you can still do some things on your own. I recommend a, uh, a grammar book. I've put a link to it down below in the notes for this lesson, down with the st study schedules you see there. Uh, I recommend that you, uh, that you do some grammar study, and I think that book is an excellent one to, to look at. So uh, do some grammar review. Uh, like we talked about earlier, you can make significant improvement to your vocabulary if you study vocab every single day. And you should be doing some non-IELTS reading and listening practice, okay? So uh, doing reading newspapers and uh, doing some listening practice from sources that are not IELTS related. You can expand your uh, abilities beyond just what you're doing to practice the test. Uh, if you look down below, I've, with, there's the 10 week uh, schedule there, the, the English language development schedule that you see down below. There are a list, a, a long list of uh, exercises that are spaced out over the course of 10 weeks. You can space them out however you want and, want and need to do that. But there are lots of um, resources there for you for reading, listening, and some ideas to, pra to improve uh, your writing and speaking as well, uh, even if you don't have a teacher to help help you out. So uh, look at that resource down below that's labeled the English language development um, uh, schedule there. Okay, so to review, 
You have more than eight weeks to study, so there's a lot you can accomplish. Of course, you're going to learn about the test and do as many practice questions as you can. You're going to take regularly scheduled mock tests, but then you're going to do some other things, okay? You're going to look outside of your, your just your the IELTS world for reading and listening practice. You're going to set a very uh, high vocabulary goal for yourself because that's going to really boost your score, the, the more vocabulary you can use actively on the exam. And consider taking a class or working with a tutor. The goal of these things down below is that you can do a lot to improve your English language skills in the amount of time you have to study for the IELTS. So get to work, but you've, you've got time, but set a, set a schedule and set an ambitious schedule for yourself because uh, the more work you put into it over the course of these months that you have, uh, the, the more you're going to benefit. Okay, good luck with your studies.